My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to Destination Unlimited. Forty million adults, 19.1% of the population aged 18 and older, cope with anxiety disorders, according to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. Can anxiety be life-enhancing and actually promote sanity and deeper understanding in our world? My guest this week on Destination Unlimited Existential humanistic psychologist Dr. Kirk Schneider asserts life enhancing anxiety fosters cross cultural bridge building, creative enrichment, and social engagement. It can also bolster spiritual well being. Dr. Schneider is a leading spokesperson for existential humanistic and existential integrative psychology, as an adjunct faculty member at Saybrook University and Teachers College, Columbia University, and a co-founder and current president of the award-winning Existential Humanistic Institute. His website is kirkjschneider.com, and he joins me this week to share his path and the latest book, Life Enhancing Anxiety, Key to a Sane World. Please join me in welcoming to Destination Unlimited, Dr. Kirk Schneider. Welcome, Kirk. Thank you very much, Victor. Thank you for joining us and sharing your new book, Life Enhancing Anxiety, He to a Sane World. Please share with our listeners your path and how it led to your calling. Well, it really began when I was a very young child. Uh, so much of my book is focused on my my personal struggle with anxiety and and efforts to to transform that anxiety into a more life-enhancing path, if you will. So it it really began with, at a very young age. Uh, when I was about two and a half. Uh, my seven-year-old brother died of a series of diseases. And uh, this was a, approximately a 10-month uh, process for him, as I understand it. And the the upheaval and the the shattering really that uh, that caused uh, both for me and my my parents uh, you know very dramatically brought me into the world of of anxiety of of trauma and uh, much again of what I've written about comes out of that time where my my parents being very psychologically minded uh actually referred me to a psychoanalyst when i was 6 years old and i was still struggling mightily with the fallout from the the death uh struggling not only within myself but uh to to a notable degree uh, with my my parents my mother in particular i think it was particularly powerful, you know, for my mother. And she she struggled a great deal emotionally to just cope with that, uh, that uh, abyss in her life. And there were times where she was both emotionally and physically absent when I was very young. And that caused a lot of tension and challenges for both of us. I give her and my father the utmost credit. On retrospect, I, I can't imagine uh, losing a child and, and what that would bring. Uh, so I, I think they, they did their absolute best to support me through the process. But more to the point of life-enhancing anxiety, which I define as the capacity to live with and make the best of uh, the, the depth and mystery of existence, um, I went through that process 
at least in a preliminary way, with uh, the psychoanalyst that I saw for about a year. And I was very fortunate in being able to obtain his notes, actually, on my experience with him about 30 years later when I was writing a book about classic horror books and films, because I was very curious about what drew me to classic horror uh, or how my own psychology uh, led led to that uh, interest. And so I visited him and he happened to have an old notebook uh, of uh, his observations of me. And so anyway, I, he agreed to give me a summary of that. And uh, I've actually published that in the book. But uh, in those notes, it's very clear to me how pivotal he was in my life, uh, both as a model of somebody who seemed to have been through a lot himself, and I think I recognized that at a very young age, and yet who had not only survived but thrived, you know, as a, a very accomplished uh, professional and decent human being, um, but also in how he helped me to develop what you might call uh, new internalizations toward life and toward myself. I had terrible fears of death and dying, of illness. Uh, I, I, I had night terrors. I was afraid of monsters and, and witches in particular. And I had a lot of distrust of, of life and, and even to some degree uh, my parents at the time, my mother in particular, because of the difficulty of, you know, the the shift in uh, in our worlds after my brother's death. And he really helped me to stay present, uh, more, more present to myself and to ask questions uh, about my situation, to be, to, to, to learn to move from a place of, you know, really abject, terror and paralysis to gradual intrigue um, and even curiosity about my situation and to learn that uh, all was not a disaster, that I was surviving and that there were some very good things in my life and uh, that I, as I was saying before, could relate to myself and the world in a more um, trusting and open way. And that led to my own creativity, actually, a kind of flowering of my own creativity and developing uh, uh, like a, a play, a, a theater <laughs> as a kid, you know, using uh, 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 little figures that I had, toy figures, and creating movie sets and plays and doing a lot of uh, impromptu um, talking on my uh, tape recorder that my father got me and doing some, some skits and things like that with him as well. And eventually uh, an interest in philosophy and psychology and uh, a fascination with the human journey I also should mention it uh, opened me to uh, a great interest in science fiction. And there were some terrific television shows at the time, which you probably remember. Absolutely. The similar age of Twilight Zone and The Outer Limits that very much spoke to me. And, you know, presenting these strange people and creatures and places that also raised fascinating questions about who we are what this life is about, uh, what really matters about our lives. So very fundamental questions that I was able to become more free to explore through this uh, psychoanalytic process. Please tell us about your mentor, Rollo May, and the practice of existentialist humanistic psychology. Rollo May was... 
a great figure on on many levels for me. Um, I had studied uh, Rollo's work uh, actually as early as probably my last year of high school and first year of college. I was fascinated, especially I think where Rollo and I really connected was around the, the whole theme of paradox, of paradoxes of human human experience. And I certainly felt those acutely uh, from very early childhood uh, in that, you know, we are at one level extremely limited, fragile, small creatures, but at the same time, we have a powerful ability to uh, create ourselves, to transcend, to experience participating in something much greater than ourselves, to connect uh, with uh, the, the cosmic spiritual background <laughs> that I think we're all traveling through. So th this paradox of, well, frankly, uh, Ernest Becker, a great cultural anthropologist who wrote, a, I think, a seminal book that Rollo really resonated with called The Denial of Death, he, he said that we're gods who shit. I mean, uh, you know, we we are uh, in a crazy condition. And uh, I think uh, Rollo and I really connected on that point of the paradoxes of, of our lives. And we're extremely limited on one hand, but we also are, uh, have a great capacity for freedom and of choice. And uh, he was generous enough to... Um, write the preface to my first book, which was The Paradoxical Self, toward an understanding of our contradictory nature. And I participated in a number of seminars that he provided. Uh, he was also on my dissertation committee and eventually asked me to co-write a, a book that became The Psychology of Existence, an integrative clinical perspective uh, for a new generation of therapists who were interested in existential psychology. Uh, but as a, as a person, he, he was uh, very multidimensional, uh, wonderfully warm and, and generous uh, to many of his students and very much include myself, uh, but, but also could be quite uh, challenging, uh, very straightforward and, you know, encountering, uh, uh, you know, a student, uh, I'll take myself, encountering me around uh, certain ideas that I held. And he would, you know, he would uh, provide time to unpack those and, and, and try to uh, help me to get more clarity on just what it was that um, I was thinking about in terms of clients that I was seeing, um, in terms of theories I was developing. And he was a straight shooter. <laughs> uh, and he wrote, freedom and anxiety are two sides of the coin. There is never one without the other. You share that your studies and personal experiences confirm this. Very much so. Um, I, I, I mean, Rollo, he actually wrote a book uh, that was a forerunner to, to my book, uh, Life Enhancing Anxiety. He wrote a book in 1950, which was based on his dissertation called The Meaning of Anxiety where he was trying to bring out the, the many dimensions of anxiety that the culture, even in 1950, he felt was, was drifting away from because of its uh, increasing emphasis on a kind of mechanized lifestyle, routine, routinized lifestyle, and that people were attempting to do all they can to get rid of anxiety instead of seeing that anxiety has many components. And it certainly can be crippling and paralyzing and overwhelming. Uh, and I don't want to downplay that at all. 
But uh, that's often because we don't address the underlying uh, uh, more fundamental anxieties of uh, the fear of the unknown. And uh, the fear of the unknown can also be a call to the unknown if if we're provided skills and tools to help us to work with that unknown. And that unknown is very primal uh, in, in my experience. And uh, through my research, I've really come around to resonating with Otto Rank's understanding of the, the bases of anxiety. And Rollo certainly resonated with that, which which is that Anxiety occurs from the moment of birth, basically, when we're thrown into existence. Uh, that radical shift from relative non-being and unity to the mother, to the cosmos, if you will, to sudden abrupt being and pandemonium, where we're in a kind of a, a groundless and helpless state. We're floundering. And the whole question is, how are we met at that point, both by our caretakers and the culture that receives us? Are we met with a more supportive and understanding approach? Um, or are we met with many fears? And, and unfortunately, I think too often uh, in our culture, especially cultures like ours, we're met with a great deal of fear. And that as a result, cuts us off from the the potentially life-enhancing aspects of the anxiety. Uh, again, uh, being able to uh, experience that call to the unknown, not, not just the terror of the unknown. And I do believe children at birth experience both a trauma of birth, as Rock would put it, but also uh, the wonder of birth. I, I think there are elements of wonder to it. So that's why I call it a drama of birth rather than trauma. And we're not very good uh, generally at uh, helping children to cultivate that those elements of wonder and discovery in their relationship to that which is unknown, that which is other and foreign. Uh, we're much more quick to hit them with rules and regulations and us and them mentalities. You stay away from those people and those places and those foreigners, et cetera, and, and stay on this sort of safe but very narrow track, quote, safe and narrow track. But as a result, uh, we develop, we often develop uh, many you know, problematic effects from that because we don't know how to handle anxiety very well. So uh, we, we have a lot of defenses that distance us from it, you know, whether those are uh, attempting to make us appear um, strong and intimidating, uh, or even tyrannical. And I, I see this individually as well as culturally to avoid any hint of our fragility and our, uh, our, our life in the unknown, if you will. Uh, or we look for quick fixes and instant results through our devices, et cetera. And when Rollo talked about freedom being the other side of the coin of anxiety, he's talking about this. He's saying that because we don't embrace that invigorating dimension of anxiety that signals that we're on the edge of wonder and discovery, we tend to live very limited uh, and, and in prison lives to, to a great extent. What are the physiological and emotional mechanisms of anxiety, and how is it triggered? Well, I was just speaking to, uh, you know, 
aspects of how it's triggered. I, I think it's triggered right from the beginning. Uh, as soon as we're we're jarred out of that passive receptive mode of the, the fetal position into that which is different, that which is other, that which is this world of, of chaos that we're trying to cope with when we're thrown into it. That's the, the psychological part. Um, and I, I do think that that forms the template, really, for virtually all future anxiety and trauma. And, and uh, again, the question is, do we have the tools, the equipment to, to work with it? Um, on a physiological level, there have been some very interesting experiments from, uh, for example, the highly reputable uh, research center in Sweden uh, called the Karolinska Institute. They did studies of, of newborns' uh, levels of stress, um, stress hormones, catecholamines that are released at the point of birth. And they found that, that those stress hormones are not only higher than normal adult stress, but they're higher than severe adult stress. So that gives us a pretty strong indication that uh, something extremely powerful is going on at the point of birth that probably makes its impression on us, um, forms the background for many of our fears and uncertainties for the rest of our lives. And again, not, not all a bad thing, uh, if we can learn how to work with it. And that's that's the whole idea of life-enhancing anxiety is being able to come into those fears of the unknown so that we can have a greater range of inner freedom to experience ourselves and the world. My um, guest is Dr. Kirk Schneider. His book, Life-Enhancing Anxiety, Key to a Sane World. Kirk, please tell our listeners where they can get your books and find out more about you and your work. They can get ready access to my books at uh, Amazon or Barnes & Noble, or certainly with the publisher, which is University Professors Press. And uh, they can get to know more about my work at my website, uh, kirkjschneider.com. And we'll be back with more of Kirk and Life Enhancing Anxiety, Key to a Sane World, after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Free your mind with OM Times Radio. IOM FM. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week, Dr. Kirk Schneider, his book, Life Enhancing Anxiety, Key to a Sane World. Kirk, how can life enhancing anxiety lead to a more sane, sustainable, and awe-informed world? First, it can help us to live with each other in a, in a more sane and sustainable way, if you will. But it begins with uh, being able to live with and, and even thrive with oneself. And that involves... Uh, you know, being able to experience other people, especially, who can help us to work with our anxiety rather than just simply avoid it uh, or erect defenses that uh, give us the illusion, let's say, of power and control, but uh, that, that really based on uh, a lot of reactivity and often lead to destructiveness and devaluation, either of ourselves or of others. 
So uh, I, I'm a, a very big uh, supporter of in-depth experiential psychotherapy, even a particular longer term psychotherapy to help us uh, cultivate more what I would call emotionally restorative relationships because we suffer so much in our society from what I'd call emotionally impoverished relationships where we're we're dealing with you know often absent parenting uh, or um, very a sparse number of people in our culture who can help help us to to cultivate our anxiety in more fruitful ways and and we're more and more reliant on our devices or our relationships which don't usually help us to work with and make the best of the depth and mystery of our existence if anything, they help us to kind of skim the surfaces. And uh, and and we get this message from our polit- politicians and from our media often. There's so much emphasis on the quick fix and instant answer. And so I think we, we, we really need to slow down. We need to have places and people who help us slow down and to, to again, work with with our anxiety so that when we can c- come from a place of greater deliberateness in our actions, our creativity, um, ability to choose more of the direction of our lives and an ability to focus on what, what deeply matters in our lives. And as I was saying, psychotherapy can be helpful there, especially depth experiential psychotherapy where the therapist is really involved as a person and not only providing techniques. Um, Meditation practices can be helpful. Certain other non-dogmatic philosophical and spiritual practices. Uh, And and all of these, I think, uh, can help our society move more toward uh, a creative, ethically sound culture um, where, again, we respond more to each other rather than react toward each other or react against each other. You share that awe. I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. No, I say, and ourselves, uh, to come more from a place of responsivity rather than reactivity. You share that awe, meaning the humility and wonder or sense of adventure toward living, takes us beyond judgment. How may we learn to embrace awe-filled experiences? Well, the sense of awe, which I define as the humility and wonder or sense of adventure toward living, is one of the most important outgrowths of life enhancing anxiety because the, the, the sense of awe is precisely about uh, having that, uh, that range within that capacity to um, experience uh, both our uh, fragile and um, vulnerable sides, which which can be very illuminating and sensitizing uh, toward toward life and toward our world and toward what deeply matters for ourselves. But it helps us attune to both the, that vulnerable and fragile side, as well as that side that is attempting to, or that, that yearns to venture out, to, to ask questions, to... Um, to be creative, uh, to experience um, participating in something much greater than ourselves, something that I, I call enchanted agnosticism, which is taking mystery seriously and being able to really uh, 
uh, fully feel uh, the the power, the amazement, the uplift of uh, our connection with the unknown. And it's that's very connected to, uh, again, a life of wonder, of discovery, of adventure. And when you think about adventure, um, it's usually not just a narrow band of happiness or uh, cheerfulness, if you will. It, it has depth to it. It's uh, think about, you know, venturing through the woods. You're not sure what's around the corner. It's certainly a degree of apprehension. Um, there's a lot of unknowns. There may be, you know, predators around, etc. You're not sure of your route exactly. But that's part of the excitement of it, right? And part of the intensity and part of what really deeply moves us in those circumstances. And at the same time, there's an exuberance about coming into that unknown and expanding our consciousness in that unknown. And uh, continually being open to the degree possible and practical to learning new things about ourselves, about the world, about other people. And uh, yeah, so I, I think this is a very vital perspective, this awe-based consciousness, both on the individual and collective level. And we didn't even get into the whole uh, movement toward supportive structure dialogues between people of very different backgrounds, especially liberals and conservatives, but it could be racial backgrounds, or religious backgrounds, etc. We have so much divisiveness in our society now, and this kind of all-based consciousness is something I and others have been trying to bring into these structured supportive dialogues. And as I was about to share, we are living in one of the most politically divisive times that I can remember in my life. You have a six-phase method, experiential democracy dialogue. Why do you believe that this can unite the polarized red and blue Americans? Well, because I've, I've seen it uh, and I've experienced it as a, a member of uh, one of these groups. I, I was a, a member and trained moderator for uh, the grassroots movement called Braver Angels which has over 10,000 members in the U.S. and all 50 states. And I participated in a, a local chapter uh, here in the, in the Bay Area. And uh, I witnessed uh, very much uh, firsthand how people on very different sides of uh, particular issues, especially conservative liberal sides, um, could not only sit down and begin to explore with each other their respective points of view in a civil way, but actually feel the possibility of being friendly or maybe even friends with that person. And uh, I think one of the most important aspects that comes out of these dialogues that I have also developed, uh, you had mentioned it before, what I call the experiential democracy dialogue, which is uh, a one-on-one, -on -one, um, I'd say more intimate uh, approach to uh, humanizing conversations between people on very contrasting sides. Um, probably the most important outcome of these dialogues is not necessarily that people end up agreeing about um, ideological stances per se, although I think it can create conditions whereby that's more likely to happen. But it's it's the ability to just simply sit with one another and, and appreciate one another as human beings as opposed to just labels or stereotypes. And if, if we could promote more of that in our society, 
uh, that would go a long way toward, uh, if not healing the, the divides in, in some total way, at least putting us on a footing that will increase the likelihood that we will be able to get along with each other better and, uh, frankly, uh, survive as, as a culture and, and world. I think that that much is on the line. That we're talking about, you know, the potential for some kind of civil, civil war or, uh, such destructiveness that uh, basically puts our our human species in the balance. When you we talk about the you know the bigger weaponry that could be involved in, in the divisiveness that we're facing, has has listening and really hearing become a lost art? I, I wouldn't say it's a lost art, and a number of us are trying to you know reawaken it as noted uh, just a moment ago, but but it's certainly, uh, I would say it's an imperiled, it's a threatened art because of the seductiveness of the quick fix, instant result world that so many of us live in and and the, the kind of haste that that promotes, you know, get, getting to the, the next appointment, um, you know, uh, trying to earn the buck as quickly as we can. And, and, and certainly there are many people who are just in very dire circumstances and, and are to have to get bread on the table. That's part of the problem in our society. We have very few safety nets for such people. And there's, there's little support or too little support, I would say, for too many people to be able to have the luxury to slow down, to reflect more deeply on what really matters in their lives, to be able to uh, in, encounter and work with the anxieties that come up for them, to, to have the means to work with psychotherapists as, as I have been privileged to do. Um, and, and so, you know, this is this is uh, a major, major challenge for us is actually having more of these places that could support life enhancing anxiety accessible and affordable to many more people, especially in underserved communities. So we have that whole problem of, of people being in a lot of uh, stress and 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 haste um, and uh, you know grabbing for straws, unfortunately, too often. But quick fixes, you know, whether that's drugs or fast food or uh, you know maybe a political champion that they're they're living through. But we also have the, uh, the, the whole corporate structure uh, that, uh, you know, emphasizes the bottom line thinking, uh, profit margin uh, thinking that uh, does not allow a lot of room for, again, deeper reflection on the, the meaning and implications of uh People's work and uh, striving for for the buck, or for some certain material goods that may not, in the long run, really be fulfilling uh, or or personally, you know, gratifying in terms of how they want to live and how they want to contribute to our our culture. Are there tips or advice that you could offer for people to learn how to listen? Yes, I would. I would begin with uh, listening to yourself, <laughs> uh, taking some time, often alone time, undistracted, even fifteen, twenty minutes, maybe go for a walk, and just uh, tune into 
what you're feeling, sensing, thinking, but especially, I think, feeling, sensing, imaging, and perhaps to the, the world around you, and develop the, a greater capacity to be with those feelings, body sensations, imaginings, and uh, attempt to practice that slowing down, that reflective process, when you're with your friends, your family, associates perhaps at work, and really uh, develop the capacity to clear space for that kind of inner listening and, and outer listening. So, for example, when you're your friend or your family member is speaking to try not to, to interrupt, give them, give them some time, give them room to say their piece and, and, and insist on having that, that time and space for yourself to, to convey what really matters. I mean, this is partly why it, it can be so helpful to look at, for example, that six-phase model that you talked about before, the, these dialogue approaches, which are highly supportive and structured, and they have ground rules that really constrain people from coming at each other in conversations, uh, you know, presuming to know what the other person is thinking or saying, rather than giving them a chance to elaborate what they're thinking or saying, uh, not having answers in your questions to people, Come, trying to come from a place of genuine curiosity as opposed to presumption, stereotype. But this, uh, you know, this takes some time to, as I say, develop that within yourself, that, that tolerance for the anxiety, the tolerance for ambiguity. Uh, a kind of uh, a centeredness that allows you to be more deliberative in your approach to yourself and to others. His book is entitled Life Enhancing Anxiety, Key to a Sane World. We'll be back with more of Dr. Kirk Schneider after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week is Dr. Kurt Schneider. His book is called Life Enhancing Anxiety, He to a Sane World. Kirk, fear of the unknown may be paralyzing. Why should you nurture trust in the ultimately unknowable? Because that is precisely what has spawned great human thought creativity, artistry, discoveries in science, in the, the practical world of business organizations, and, and certainly in relationships, being able to, you know, to stay with, to work with, to in, inquire into the unknown with lovers, with friends, family. Uh, I mean, these are part of the marvelous uh, adventures of being human. And and again, uh, I, I guess what I would summarize it as uh, so life-affirming because um, that ability to be in a wonder and discovery mode uh, enables us to to uh, optimize our our ability to be ethical 
with each other, you know, to 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 live with uh, our differences, our otherness, if you will, to build bridges between those differences and that otherness, and it it also spawns a, spawns a great deal of creativity, of innovation, because that you know that requires a capacity to tolerate some degree of anxiety, uncertainty, and a failure at times uh, to uh, to come up with great ideas, great practices, um, great applications that uh, improve our lives. You mentioned relationships. I've been blessed with wonderful life enhancing relationships. What are the key traits of relationships that lift you up and restore your mind, body, and spirit? Well, we were talking about Rollo May before and being a straight shooter and, you know, somebody who really wants to really encourages an authentic connection, an authentic encounter and and uh i i think that's part of it is people being real with each other um but that also brings in a responsibility i i i don't want to downplay the the element of um a realness and authenticity about what uh, what that what that situation involves, uh, um, what that person, let's say, can tolerate or can deal with in an encounter. Um, it's an authenticity and a realness to the whole context, is my point, and not just one's own whim. <laughs> But I think the more aware we are, the more conscious we are, uh, the more capable we are of seeing the many dimensions of a given conversation or relationship and being, and being honest about what is, what is workable, what is reachable in those situations, in those relationships. Are grief and anxiety related? And if so, how may we turn grief into a life-enhancing experience? Well, they're very much related. And I, I was uh, speaking before to this, uh, you know, this topic when I was talking about my own grieving, my own gap in my life, both from my brother's death and the, the fallout that that caused with with parenting. But the other side of that is, at least for me, and, I, and many of the patients that I've seen as well, once they're able to stay with that grief, work with it, learn from it, is that it opens up new worlds as well. Uh, I mean, it's it's like a rip in the fabric of the routine and familiar. And that rip opens us to all kinds of unknowns and bottomless pits and a kind of a free fall that can be very scary. But again, the more we can work with it, be supported in the process of learning and understanding about it, it's like our eyes adjusting to a very dark basement. Uh, the things that were so threatening and overwhelming before begin to be seen as potential, as door, potential doorways or opportunities that we didn't see before or areas of interest that we didn't see before. And uh, so in that way, Grieving, for example, can sensitize us to the poignancy of life, uh, to to the the significance of of our lives, and 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 the the preciousness of our lives, and, and the whole question of again, 
what deeply matters about this time and space we have. It's really a, a flash between two voids. And uh, how are we going to use that? So grieving can bring our attention to that, uh, recognizing how readily we can lose someone who's so close. And, and of course, we can lose it ourselves or a part of ourselves how how passing time is and nature is also more ethically attuned as well i I really think that life enhancing anxiety is a basis perhaps a renewed basis for a more ethical stance in the world because we, we recognize our fragility and the need to be sensitive to it and supportive of it, as well as our great capacity to be bold and discover. What would you like readers to take away from life-enhancing anxiety, key to a sane world? Well, I'd say, first of all, to realize that we have such skyrocketing anxiety in our world, both individually and collectively, precisely because we have not we have re- not really faced the deeper and more fundamental anxiety that could help prevent or limit that skyrocketing destructive anxiety that we have in the world so much of that is secondary our violence secondary to the anxiety that we really need to address prior to that secondary in the sense that that is caused by avoiding (laughs) confronting the more fundamental anxiety, the fear of the primal fear of the unknown, which can be a call to the unknown if transformed through supportive understanding relationships. Um, So our our physical destructiveness, our uh, mental and emotional destructiveness, which is also about avoiding uh, many of those earlier anxieties, our devaluations of ourselves, which cause a lot of anxiety as well. (laughs) Again, are secondary. That's a big point that I'm really trying to get through to people here. And so it's so important that we you know, we really reassess and and reform child rearing practices so that um, caretakers are able to be more present to their their newborns right from the beginning to the degree possible to provide that kind of holding environment that some of the psychoanalysts talk about as opposed to an environment where they're emotionally or physically absent and leave the kid floundering and as a result forming all kinds of defenses against that floundering which promote illusions of power and control that usually don't hold up very well or become very destructive toward themselves or others. Um, uh, reform of child rearing practices, reform of education, where we're helping students to to cope with, to tolerate their anxieties more in exploring um, subjects. I, I've been a big fan of field trips because they are more experiential. They involve people's whole bodily experience as opposed to just kind of, you know, uh, narrow intellectual uh, learning, which is important. I'm not denying that, but I think holistic experiences in school can be very important, such as field trips, uh, plays, enactments of of great historical events, for example. Um, In science, uh, being able to experience, experience the wonder of the scientific ideas and, and practices through experimentation oneself or thought experiments or you know, watching great films. And sometimes science fiction can certainly promote that sense of awe and wonder about uh, 
scientific discovery and application, also in, involving students involving themselves in those experiential democracy dialogues, I think could be very valuable to helping them come to terms with their own otherness and the, the, the other of the other person that they're you know, stereotyping or labeling. My guest is Dr. Kirk Schneider. His book, Life Enhancing Anxiety, Key to a Sane World. Kirk, one more time, please tell our listeners where they can get your book and find out more about you and your work. Uh, so again, they can readily go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or the publisher, University University Professors Press, to obtain the book. Go or, or go to my website, kirkjschneider.com. And there's all kinds of information about the book and other books uh, and videos about my, my work. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing this very important message. Well, thank you so much, Victor. Really appreciated the time and, and your listening. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the voice Berman. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>